Uh, my name is Rick Brennan, and I'm a native Houstonian, a rare species. <laughs> uh, I'm also a middle school social studies teacher, and I have been for 13 years now, which I think makes me an even rarer species. I don't know. Uh, but I'm here today to ask you to think social studies, as strange as that might sound, which is exactly the problem that I see. So what I mean when I say think social studies? Well, if you would think back maybe to your earliest social studies experiences, uh, maybe in elementary school, if you're anything like me, those first lessons in history were about Christopher Columbus and the first Thanksgiving. So if you're anything like me, you're still recovering from those early history lessons, <laughs> even now. Uh, but, but beyond elementary school, your middle school experiences, American history, Texas history, of course. I mean, the whole country studies Texas history, right? <laughs> and then we have high school, government, economics. So think back to those experiences. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call out some words, some phrases. And if any of them resonate with you or remind you of your social studies experience to date, then just raise your hand and hold it high. Okay, are you with me? All right, let's get started. First word, textbooks. Oh my goodness. All right, we're off to a good start. Worksheets. I'm on to something, I think. Chapter tests. All right, names and dates and memorization. Exactly. Um, lectures and notes and more notes. How many of you, you can remember that pain in your hand from history class? from taking so many notes. I feel your pain. And this is a big one, boring. In fact, why don't you say it with me? Boring, exactly. Brothers and sisters in boredom. <laughs> um, now, uh, I, I say this, I ask my, my sixth graders these questions every year to get a sense of what I'm up against, day one. And I find that they, like many of you, and like me too, um, find history and social studies to be these very boring things, rather than what it is. History is the greatest story ever told. It just gets lost in translation. Now, I didn't learn that lesson until I went to the University of Houston. Go Cougs. All right, all right. And who knows, if U of H had not intervened and saved the day with me, then I might have lived the rest of my life as a history hater. Instead, I became a history teacher because I wanted my students to get a good, solid social studies experience before they got to college, just in case that day never came. So I became a history teacher to breathe life into history, and I tried everything I could. I thought, sixth graders, they love to talk. So why not have a discussion and debate oriented class? So I did. We learned history that way, and that worked pretty well. Many of my students were engaged, but others, not so much. I mean, they might have been better listeners than speakers. They might have been shy. If you're a teacher, sometimes you, you know that a small number of students can dominate a conversation and turn it off for the others. So even though many of my students were engaged, others weren't, and that's a really frustrating feeling for a teacher. So I changed directions, and I thought, everyone loves art, so I'll do art history-based projects, and that's how I'll get them in. And so I energized a new subsection of my students, and then left a new subsection behind, who may have thought that art was frivolous, or something you just get done so you can move on to the next thing, or they're self-conscious about their own art. Whatever it was, they weren't engaged, so I sort of left them behind too. Again, a very frustrating feeling. And that happened every time I changed directions. It was sort of like a, a sad shell game. Until games. When I mixed games into the fold, everything changed. The class was electrified. If you're a teacher, you know what I mean. Boys and girls were involved, introverts and extroverts, all learning styles, and it was fun. And who doesn't want a fun class? So I set out then and there, I thought, why not have a gameplay day every day? I mean, why not? So I set out to build a curriculum-aligned social studies learning game um, that would take my students through the whole 
coursework. I thought it would take three months to build this game. It ended up taking me and my teaching partner, Jason Darnell, eight years to finish this game. And the game is called Historia. Historia. So what is Historia? Well, the short and skinny of it is it's a social studies simulation and strategy game aligned to the curriculum that teaches world history and cultures, government, geography, economics, and much more than that, too, through interactive gameplay. I like to say that Historia teaches the human experience through the human experience and that it works so well because it's fun. Um, that's what I would say about it. I have a short clip with some students speaking about Historia, so why don't we listen to what they say. The best part of Historia, I think, is uh, being able to create your own history because not only do you learn about other countries during that time period, you get to learn about uh, what has happened and what can happen to you. Have you ever heard of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth? That comes from Hammurabi's code. If I have a teacher standing in front of me talking, it's very hard for me to remember because I get bored, distracted. In a historian, no place to get distracted. You're working the whole time and making decisions as a group. All right. So there you have it. So how do you play this game? Right? How do you play the game? Well, Historia covers 4,000 years of history, from 2000 BCE to 2000 CE, so it connects the ancient past to the modern times. Those 4,000 years are sort of sliced and diced into 20 rounds of interactive gameplay that we call epochs. And in each epoch, student teams form student governments, and these governments make a whole host of decisions, like balancing a budget, for example, there was no joke there, I promise you. <laughs> and, and the sum total of those decisions over those 4,000 years and through those 20 rounds creates their very own people's history. Uh, anything that happens in history can happen to their people, so they had better make good decisions. If they make good, wise decisions, their cultures grow bigger and stronger and more influential. And if they make unwise decisions, the opposite happens. So they have to know so much social studies. And they want to because they want to do well in the game. It's that simple. So it really comes together nicely as a classroom system. Right? So what did I see in my classroom that would make me such a believer in learning games like Historia? Well, first off, using Historia in my classroom, test scores improved. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't become a teacher for that, but that's a good thing. Grades improved, attendance improved. I like this one. Historia cured almost all of my classroom management ills, nearly one, all of them. Um, it did create one problem for me, though. It's kind of funny. The problem Historia created for me was that my students, who were former history haters, now were so excited by the social studies learning in my class that they almost became addicted to it. And so my biggest classroom management issue was calming them down. <laughs> and that is an absurd problem to have, I admit. Uh, but it's a problem that I wish on all of my teacher friends everywhere. Because it's a good problem to have. Right? So even though these are all great things, the, the scores and all that, I think it still it only paints a partial picture of the power of learning games like Historia. So in the short time I have left, what I'd like to do is share two classroom stories, I think, that help complete the story, complete the picture. And the first story goes back to Hammurabi's Code, which was mentioned in the film. So in case you don't know, Hammurabi's Code is probably the first ever written law code. Um, it was written by a Sumerian Babylonian king named Hammurabi. And by our standards, these laws would be quite harsh. I mean, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right, comes straight out of Hammurabi's Code. So I had taught Hammurabi's code for many years through discussion and debate and only had marginal success. So the, start, the story I'm going to share with you today comes from the first year I ever used Historia, the first epoch in the game, and the first question that I got at the end of that epoch. So it's a series of firsts, which is one of the reasons why I remember this story so well. So a student raises their hand to ask a question. I call on her and she says, about Hammurabi's code, Mr. Brennan, I just don't understand. 
Why would a government want the people to fear it? I mean, I can still see those words sort of coming out of her mouth and flying across the room to slap me in the face. I mean, I was stunned from a 12-year-old, this type of question. So I threw it out to the class. What do you guys think? And you know what they did? Every one of them raised their hands. And that is when I had the discussion and debate I always wanted. But it grew organically out of the game. So that's what I saw. And I realized in real time at that moment, no matter how hard I tried as a teacher, and I tried very hard, I could never take the learning there. So I submitted to the game, then and there, and let Historia lead the way from then on. And where did it lead us? Here's my last story. Going back to art, at the end of the year, I asked my students to create a contiguous piece of cave art inspired collage art that would cover these 4,000 years of history. All pictures, no words, their own creations. The words would have to come from them, right? The story would come from them and we would just listen. And you know what? My 12 year olds, 11 year olds, the occasional 10 year old that I taught, they could all do that. They could recall 4,000 years of history with no notes. They could connect the dots and make sense of the story all the way up to modern times. And if I tried tried to trip them up with an extemporaneous question, they could answer it. They could do all of those things by sixth grade. If you contrast that kind of social studies experience to the experience that I listed at the beginning of my talk, just consider the possibilities. I mean, imagine the world that my sixth graders will create because when you know your history, you see that we're all part of the same story and that we all hold history in our hands even now. Thank you for listening.